Hello and welcome to the Educational Forum. I am your host, Diane Sullivan. Those of you who know me know of my love for animals and know of my best friend and companion, Winnie. On today's show, we will sit down and talk to Dr. Irene Pepperberg about her best friend and companion, an African gray parrot named Alex. Irene has written a heartwarming book entitled Alex and Me, how a scientist and a parrot discover a hidden world of animal intelligence and formed a deep bond in the process. Irene begins by telling us about her first connection to birds. Oh, I was about four years old. My dad got me a little budgie, the, the shell parakeets from the, you know, Woolworths. Uh, we lived above a store. There were no children around. Mm -hmm. My mother really didn't want children, so she took care of my physical needs, but there wasn't much emotional connection. My dad was working full time, going to school, and taking care of his ill mother. So he was barely there. He'd kiss me good morning, and I might not see him till the next morning. So he bought me this little budgie for companionship. What role did the succession of parakeets play in your life? They really sensitized me to the intelligence of these birds, to the personality, really, of these birds. Each one of them was a little bit different, and each one of them was equally fun and, and entertaining. You were a vivacious reader of books, so of course you read Dr. Doolittle. What impact did that have on you? Interestingly, I don't think it had that much impact at the time, mm -hmm. other than the fact that I had budgies that could talk to me, so <laughs> it, it made complete sense. What I find interesting is I've gone back to these books and found that, wow. that this fellow was a very good ethologist because he writes about the different ways that different animals communicate. And of course now, how many years later, we're learning that much of what he was suggesting is actually true. Well, thanks to you, we're learning that in chief part. Even today, Irene, there are substantially less women in science than men. And back in your day, you were really a pioneer. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your high school years. You graduated, was it third in your class out of 1,600 students? And then you went on to college. So tell us a little bit about your interest in the sciences and your pursuing at least a college degree in the field of science. Well, I remember being always interested in science. My father was encouraging me to be a biologist. He was a frustrated biochemist. But when I took high school chemistry, it was a very interesting period. Um, women were obviously not majoring in things like that. And I was so frightened about this chemistry course, because everybody told me how hard it was, that I borrowed the books over the summer and started teaching myself a little bit of it. Wow. So when I got to class, I knew this stuff. And then I found that it was interesting. And I liked the order of it. And I did really well. And my high school chemistry teacher just kept encouraging me. He said, hey, you know, you've got, got an aptitude for this. Go for it. And so I'm applying for colleges and the high school you know, guidance counselors saying, well, you, you know, you maybe should try for Vassar and things like that. And I'm going, no, 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 I'm interested in science. So he looks at me and says, well, apply to MIT. And I go, but women don't go there. And he said, yes, yes, they're accepting women. You know, you should, should look at this. And he arranged an interview with one of the women who was actually there. Mm -hmm. And she came, come back to our school and talked to me about it. So I entered MIT at 16. I was one of the large classes. We were 50 women. We were the first large class of women. Out of how many students? Out of about 1,200, 1,300. So 50 women out of approximately 1,200 students were now women? Yes. Okay, yes. now, did you continue your passion with chemistry? Yes, I did. I graduated, got my, my undergraduate degree there. I then went into graduate school in chemical physics at Harvard. And it was very interesting, that particular year we had a lot of women in our class. And it turned out the reason was not that Harvard was becoming so, you know, pro-feminist, <laughs> but it was the year that the deferment, draft deferment for men ended for a graduate school. Oh, yeah. And they needed teaching fellows. Sure. And the men weren't, couldn't apply anymore. They were all dropping out of graduate school to become high school teachers or doing anything that would give them draft deferments. So here we were, this, the class was about half women. It was amazing. Wow. And, we, and of course, we have thought, oh, wow, Harvard's really paying attention to all this. But it was, you know, other reasons. <laughs> An ulterior motive. Right. And it was not a very friendly uh, attitude there towards women. It was really quite difficult. Certainly, I've heard that to be true. 
and uh, and hopefully it's changed a great deal today. I, I, I don't know if it has or hasn't. Do you have any uh, you inclination? Know, well, <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to bring this up, but you know, you remember it wasn't too long ago that Larry Summers made some comments about women in science. That's correct. That's correct. How quickly we forget. Tell us a little bit, if you would, about what motivated you or why your interest in studying human-animal communications. So I'm halfway through my doctorate at Harvard in theoretical chemistry. I'm realizing that what I'm doing is interesting, but I basically saw the handwriting on the wall. That was what was going to take me seven years to do computational mathematical modeling. As computers got better, it was probably going to take a computer, you know, seven, I thought at that point seven hours, now it's probably seven nanoseconds. Um, and I, I, you know, I stopped being terribly interested in it and was thinking, you know, where am I headed? And it was also incredibly difficult as a woman at that point. Sure. I mean, there were no, Harvard had not a single woman on faculty in chemistry. I think they had maybe made their first hire in physics, maybe. And they kept telling us, well, there, there aren't any qualified women to hire. And we're looking, uh, what about all of us that you're graduating? <laughs> and, but that was true uh, across all of the, sure. the schools. Yeah. So I'm watching these NOVA programs on animal-human communication, on the signing chimps, on work with whale, singing whales, on the dolphin studies. And I think back that to my work with my, my veggies, you know, they would talk to me. Why isn't anybody doing this with a parrot? Parrots can talk. So I had this epiphany. Mm -hmm. that I was going to switch fields and do this. And I did finish the doctorate in chemistry first. Good for you. But I spent 40 hours a week finishing the doctorate and 40 hours a week training myself in linguistics and neurobiology and psychology and anything I could, could get my hands on. And of course, Harvard was great for that because of the libraries. You know, you could just immerse yourself in the Museum of Comparative Zoology and the psych library and read anything you needed because it was there. Right. Your husband at the time, David, accepts a position at Purdue, and you decide to acquire your own African gray parrot. And of course, Alex comes along, very special bird. So tell us about the acquisition of Alex and a little bit about your early years, your early uh, journal entries, what yeah. it is you write. Well, we started, I started by first putting in a grant proposal to do this work. I get to Purdue and at the time the attitude was, no, no, we hired your husband. You're supposed to stay home, bake cookies and make babies. <laughs> and I went, I don't think so. And so it took, I could spend an hour explaining what I went through, but finally we got them to put in a grant, to let me put in a grant proposal. Mm -hmm. And the reviews came back essentially asking me what I was smoking. Because most studies at the time were working with animals that were genetically close to humans, phylogenetically close to humans, so the great apes. Right. Uh, the last common ancestor between a parrot and a great ape was 280 million years ago. Not so good. Um, also, most of these studies were using animals with large brains, such as the dolphins. Parrots have the brain size of a shelled walnut. Again, not so good. Most studies using birds used pigeons. They use Skinnerian operant training. You starve an animal down to 80% of its normal body weight. You put it in a Skinner box and you go from there. And I wanted to just talk to the bird. So there were all these arguments that I wouldn't be able to maintain my professional distance. So it was quite, quite a difficult set of reviews that came back. Mm -hmm. But I decided to persevere. I went out and we got Alex. Uh, tested out all these different pet stores. The, the one criterion was to find a bird that was domestically bred, which in the 1970s was quite difficult. Really? Because most of them were being imported from Africa. Sure. They, that meant that one bird in ten made it from the savanne into someone's living room. So the one cri you know, criterion I had was to find a hand-raised bird. I found a pet store in the Chicago area, so we drove up. There were eight or nine birds in the cage. I had the fellow working with the birds pick one because I didn't want anybody to argue that there was anything special. And he just scooped one up in a butterfly net, flipped him on his back, trimmed his beak, his wings, his you know, toenails, and put him in a little box and said, here, $600, please. And that was how I acquired Alex. Wow. And then I resubmitted, the, I worked with Alex, and we started getting a few labels. And so I resubmitted the grant. And this time I was really lucky. I had somebody on panel who was studying bird song. And that meant that this person, I don't know if it was a male or female, but I could tell from the reviews it was a birdsong person, recognized the striking parallels between the development of vocal communication in birds and humans. There had been a lot of work being done on that in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And said, all right, this woman isn't crazy. 
this may not, or not work, but give her money for a year and we'll see what happens. Explain a little bit about vocal cognitive ability to the audience. Yeah. Um, when you look at these parallels, these are mainly originally done with, again, songbirds, but we know that in both birds and humans, there's a sensitive phase during which exposure allows development to proceed most readily. So just like for humans where, you know, you and I could learn a foreign language, but we'd sound better if we learned it as a child, the same is true of songbirds. Okay, they can learn other species songs, but they're not going to sound as good as if they learn them when they're babies, and they okay. can learn. They both have babbling or practice periods where they experiment with the sounds that will ultimately become part of the repertoire. They need to learn the context in which to use the songs, just as children need to know, you know, what's that versus who's that for inanimate versus animate objects. Birds need to learn what to sing for territorial defense versus mate attraction. And even at that time, we knew that there were specific parts of the brain that were responsible in both birds and humans and that they were somewhat analogous mm. for the learning, the storage, the production of these vocalizations. After a couple of years with Alex, you have probably the very best trained bird in captivity, but you still cannot obtain funding really for um, experimentation and development. Yeah. How do you account for that? Well, it was interesting. We, we, got, you know, we got the first grant for a year. We got the second grant for another mm -hmm. year. Then um, the Reagan administration came in, and there was just a general overall cutback in government funding for everything. Yeah. So instead of being fund the National Science Foundation, instead of being funded 20 percent, went down to about 10 percent funding. So I mean, it was only really standard types of research that were getting funded at that point. Mine wasn't standard. Um, so we got a little bit of private foundation money. Um, we barely got through. When funding came back, again, we got funding again. Then 1986, we just done a most incredible study with Alex on concepts of same and different. Green wool. How many green wool? How many green wool? How many green wool? Four. Good parent. Good boy. Um, really breakthrough work. I put in my grant proposal and comes back, you know, great proposal, but we're, again, we're out of money. And this is, you know, this is not standard research. So, yeah, you were in the top 20, but we're only funding the top 10. But you don't give up. No. And it was this type of perils of Pauline yeah. lifestyle that every time Alex did something incredibly exciting, we'd get press, you know, publicity. I'd be invited to incredible meetings, you know, international congresses to present the data. And then it would be like, clunk, how are we going to keep the work going? That's right. Tell us now some of the delightful accomplishments of Alex. Tell us a little bit about his use of the word no, or nah, as I understand yeah. it. Um, <laughs> well, you know, we, we were training him to identify all these different objects. He learned to identify like 50 objects in seven colors and five shapes and quantities up to about six over the years. But the issue was we started with objects that he wanted to obtain. So it was very easy to teach him to label those things because, hey, these were fun. He wanted the wood to chew on and the paper to tear apart and things. Then we started getting to objects that weren't quite as much fun. So we had to teach him the label want so that he could ask us for what he wanted as his reward to separate identification from requests. Um, but sometimes he still just didn't want to work and he started with this little nah type thing when he didn't want to work or he'd do things like we'd show him an object and if he were not working with us we'd say well I'm gonna go away I'm gonna give you a time out so he learned to say I'm gonna go away and he'd walk to the edge of the perch and away from <laughs> us sometimes he'd give us all the wrong answers so if the answer was one color he would repeat the six wrong colors several why did he times. do that I think it was more fun for him, yep. made it more interesting. I mean, I think at some point, if he could have said, I've already done that, he would have. Because, I mean, I would need, you know, 60, sometimes 100 trials for statistical significance. Yep. He would zip through the first dozen or even 20 trials because it was fun, it was a new project, and then it was like, hello, yeah, we've done this. We've done this already. Don't make me do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's boring. Yeah. You describe in your book which I must interject is a wonderful book. Thank what you. a wonderful read. In any event, you, you say that during your years at Purdue, you and Alex are like vagabonds, as I recall. Well, we, you know, we, 
we did not have our own lab space, basically. They shifted us from whatever was convenient from one place to another. I, mean, I, I think we had, I don't know, f at least three, maybe four different laboratories, mm -hmm. depending on who needed what space. So, um, you know, it was just, okay, whatever, you know, as long as you let me do the work, we'll do it. But it was really difficult because each time we moved the lab, it interrupted the training. Oh, sure it did. And I would imagine that it was difficult for Alex initially to make those transitions. Am I wrong about that? No, it was, you know, it was, hey, you know, this was different space. Is it safe? You know, and it took him a while to, to get used to each space. Yeah. Describe some of the tests for colors and shapes. Tell the audience a little bit what that was all about. Well, the idea was, could an animal understand ca categories, okay, and categories in a hierarchical sense? The idea is not just that this is, you know, what's green and what's not green, but that green and blue and yellow, et cetera, formed a category that could be lumped under the term color, and another category, like two, three, four, five, six corner, that could be lumped under shape, and paper, wood, and rawhide under material. So the idea was learning a categorical concept label, color, shape, matter, and then learning which colors went under that. So that I could show him an object that had color and shape and material and say, Alex, what's this? Lock. What color? Green. What shape? Four corner. What matter? Wood. So he understood all those concepts. And it also meant that I was getting away from rote responses. So that when I showed him this object, he never knew, oh, I, you know, what to say until he heard me ask a question. And wow, so, that is significant. Yes. Sure. Yes. So it was wow. not simply stimulus response. Oh, right. I see this thing. Every time I see this thing, I say green. Uh-uh. He had to think. He had to think. He had to wait for my question. Wow. How many orange block? How many orange block? Say better. You're right. How many orange block? You were right, but it wasn't clear. Six, good parents. Another particular comment that Alex sometimes would make was the use of, I'm sorry. So I can't wait to ask you this. Did he feel remorse? No, there was absolutely no contrition. <laughs> <laughs> it was what he learned to diffuse a tense situation. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that you see ritualized in animals, where a dog will, will present its jugular as if to say, you know, oh, I, I'm sorry, you know, kill me, it's okay. And of course that diffuses an aggressive situation. And so Alex learned to say, I'm sorry, to do that. And it started because he was sitting on a perch and I had uh, coffee, some coffee and I wanted to go outside for something. And I put the coffee cup away from where I thought he could possibly get it. And I come back, whatever, later, and there he is on the floor with the coffee cup in pieces all around him. And of course the first response like any mother type person, you say, ah, you know what happened? How did you do that? And then you stop and go, this is a bird. You know, and you're, you're ranting. It's not his fault. This was an interesting thing. He went to explore it. He knocked it off the shelf. He ended up there. And then, of course, you're worried that he's hurt. So you pick him up and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he put the two together. Oh, she's yelling at me. And then she says, I'm sorry. If I say this, she'll stop yelling at me. <laughs> wow. And that's where it, it, it came about. What a great story. How does Alex react when he sees himself in the mirror? The first time, one of the students had actually taken him into the washroom with her because she was afraid to leave him for fear that he would break coffee cups or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And so um, there's a shelf in front of the mirror, and she puts him there. And, you know, he starts banging. He says, what's that? What color? And she looks and says, well, that's you, Alex. You're a gray parrot. The color is gray. And so the problem was, of course, that messed up any mirror study we could do because she had already told him it was him, but he learned the color gray that way. Wow. David's post at Purdue ends. Where do you and Alex go next? We end up at Northwestern. David gets a job at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and I get a visiting assistant professorship at Northwestern. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, but visiting assistant professorship means it's year to year contracts. Okay. So that's not so good. Tell us the banana reef story. So we're trying to train Alex and another bird. We thought maybe we could use another bird as a model too. So a, a person I know at Northwestern brings in his bird and I said, well, what's your bird's favorite thing? And he says, apple. So I said, okay, we'll train apple. And so we start training apple and Alex, you know, over the course of some time doesn't want to learn apple, but all of a sudden starts saying, what banary? 
And I'm looking, what? <laughs> so I call up one of my colleagues who's a linguist there, and he says, oh, oh, lexical elision. I say, what? <laughs> and he says, well, you know, banana cherry, it probably tastes a little bit like a banana. It probably looks like a large cherry. So he's made up this new label. And I'm going, ooh, okay, <laughs> this is pretty cool. Wow. Did Alex really, in hindsight, know what he was saying? Oh, most definitely, yeah. most definitely. I mean, that was the whole point of the study, to design the experiments to show that he really was. So as I mentioned, you know, could show him one object and he had to listen for my questions. Right. We could show him two objects and say, you know, what's here? Key. How many? Two. What color bigger? Green. You know, what, it's different, Co you know, color. Let's explore that a little bit more, the concept of same and different and why that's significant. It's very significant because early studies on same different with animals really weren't looking at same different. They were looking at identity versus non-identity. So you show the animals two objects and yep. if they're identical, the animal said same or, or hit a button that said same or mm -hmm. did a match to sample or something like that. And if they were different, and, and it, you know, they said not same. And when people started thinking about this, particularly David Premack was very important in this, started looking at this and thinking, well, wait a minute, if the animal or subject really understands concepts of same and different, they could tell us what attribute was same or different. So it, you could show two blocks, the same size, the same material, but different colors, and if the animal really understood a concept of same and different, they could tell you that it was just the color wow. that was different, and they could transfer that to any other two objects that had nothing to do with the original blocks on which you were training, but you could take out, you know, balls and say, okay, what same or different, and they could also respond because they understood the abstract concepts of same and different. Pretty unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> your marriage ends. You spend most of your time in the lab with Alex. What was that period in your life like? Well, we had moved to the University of Arizona, and this is my first real faculty job. So although I had been this visiting assistant professor, now it's not just the teaching, but it's the faculty meetings, and that's on top of running this huge lab now. I mean, thankfully, I have space. I yeah. have graduate students. Um, we get more birds. So I'm wor working about 75, 80 hours a week mm -hmm. um, when I'm in town and doing a lot of traveling. I'm being invited to a lot of places. Also, even though we have good support from the National Science Foundation at this stage, I am only given support for one graduate student, and I had three or four students. The department would pay for one, so I set up the Alex Foundation to raise money to support the other students mm -hmm. in the laboratory. Good for you. Alex develops a fungal infection. Tell us about that, and most particularly when he says, want to go back. Um, aspergillosis, it's a rather nasty infection. Um, this was actually while we were still at Northwestern. And I have to take him to the veterinarians, and they're testing him. They basically tell me, no, he has to stay here. We can't do this on an outpatient basis. We have to have him here all the time. Well, he's never been away from the laboratory and all the students and myself. So I'm, I'm putting him in this little tiny hospital cage, and I'm walking out the door. And you know, we had this I'm sorry, which had been before. And also, he used to say, like, want to go back, where if he was, you know, on the back of a chair, he'd say, want to go back, meaning take me back to the cage, things like that. So here I'm walking out the door, and there's this pathetic little voice going, I'm sorry, come here, want to go back, which, you know, so I'm trying to explain to him, no, no, I'll be in tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow, just like every day I tell you, I'll see you tomorrow, I will be back, and it was, it was really difficult. Did he understand that, do you think? It's hard to say. It's yeah. hard to say, but I, initially I don't think he believed it, but when I st started coming back, okay, every day I would, you know, it was, it was a nightmare. I was actually in the process of moving the lab, so I would get up in the morning, go into Northwestern, teach my class, then get into the car, drive roughly an hour to the vet practice, stay with him until, you know, the edge of rush hour so I could beat rush hour traffic back to Northwestern, and then spend the evenings packing up the lab to deal with all this stuff and preparing for co courses and, and writing the papers and things. So once he got the into the routine that I was coming back every day, then I think it was much easier. Sure. But initially, there was no trust that, I'm in this weird place, you're leaving me. You know? It's like a, a parent leaving a child or and any, 
Yeah, or any pet owner having to leave their animal at the vet, which I have still refused to do. Can't somehow do that. But in any event, tell the story, a delightful story in the book. I had a real laugh about greys tending to speak like their owners. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> which, which one you're talking about in the book. The but there kick was... your blank story. <laughs> oh, oh, that was my friend. Um, it was not Alex. Okay, this was not Alex. This is my friend Debbie and Michael Smith, who have a bird named Charlie Parker. And uh, their bird sounds exactly like Michael. I mean, exactly. I was actually there in their house, and Debbie has Charlie on her shoulder, and she picks up the phone and she says, hello, and the bird says, hello, and the, she says, no, 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 you don't have me and Michael, you have me and Charlie on the phone, because the person at the other end of the phone will think it's Michael. thought it was Michael. And so the story in the book is there's these, some really obnoxious uh, agent, you know, wanting to sell them some insurance or whatever, and Debbie's trying very nicely to, you know, just get them off the phone, and at some point the bird kicks in with this kind of expletive deleted type thing about, you know, just get off the phone and, and it's quite embarrassing had it been somebody they wanted to talk to, but at this point it was really quite pleasant because the bird did the dirty work for them. So that's typical of an African gray, they will develop a voice that mimics their own. Oh yes, um, Alex supposedly sounded very much like me. Um, we had one incident in Northwestern where I'm coming back after lunch and I open the door and there's some guy in the lab and I'm, what's this? And he's looking at me and he's saying, uh, what's going on? And he said, well, I knocked on the door and somebody told me to come here. So I did. And, and Alex was separated from the thing. There was a little curtain in front of his place so that when people would come in and out, they wouldn't directly interrupt him. So there was a little entryway. So this man is, is standing from the entryway and, and I said, you know, and then somebody asked me what my problem was, and I said that I had come here to fix the, the pipe that was, was, you know, leaking. And, and, but I didn't see anybody, and then you walked in, and of course it was Alex. <laughs> Introduce us to Griffin. Griffin is a much younger bird. Um, he is a really a little sweet character. He's like the little boy who knows all the answers, but is, is kind of intimidated by the bigger guys in class, and that was Alex that intimidated him. But, um, I needed a second bird to, to, uh, to do some more research, to test some things out, to prove that Alex wasn't some avian Einstein. And a, an avian vet had arranged for me to pick up a bird in Georgia. And uh, the gal who had the aviary sets me out on the floor with all these little baby birds. She had picked out an already weaned older bird about 14 weeks. It was weaned, it was flighted. But she thought, you know, let's just see. So she puts me on the floor with all these little baby birds, and this seven and a half week old thing comes up to me, week, 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 pulling at my clothing, looking at me, and she, you know, Terry looks at me, and I look at her, and she says, um, I think you've just been chosen. And I said, but I don't know anything about hand feeding. And she says, we'll teach you. Well, you can't learn that much, and it's very dangerous to yeah. hand feed. So, um, and this is something, don't ever tell me if there's anything I can do for you, because I. <laughs> bring people up in that. And my friend Debbie from Salt Lake, who was a vet tech at the time, had told me that. So I'm calling her from the Athens airport, you know, from the Atlanta airport in Georgia, and I'm saying, Debbie, remember what you said? Well, here's my credit card. Get a flight <laughs> and to, you know, Tucson. I'll meet you there. You've got to train us because you're a vet tech and you know about hand feeding, and I don't want to take the chance with this bird. But everything works out. Everything works out. You become almost a slave to Alex as he's quite successful in labeling things. Then he starts demanding, I want X, Y, and Z, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you, you know, you get to the point of, no, you can't have this right now. Now let's do some more work before we do this. Yeah. <laughs> Cute story. Alex was a show-off. I'll use that word oh, loosely. Yes. And he was very happy in the lab. Tell us about the time you take him home. Well, I would take him home not very often, um, but sometimes over holidays when the students weren't there. And he really wasn't too happy at home because he didn't have it. The students call themselves parrot slaves. I mean, they were always there at his every whim. And if I took him home, you know, I mean, I would leave him in one room and I would go in the other room to do something and he would be alone and come here, come here. <laughs> but he, he got used to it after a while and he did like to sit there on the perch while I would sit there and work next to him that was that was really good so one time I take him home and unbeknownst to him 
At this point, some little screech owls had started to nest in the eaves of the house. And so I take him home, and all of a sudden it's, want to go back, want to go back, want to go back. And he'd often do that for the first moment or two, and I'd say, Alex, just wait a minute, let me get your food, let's get the cage set up. He just wouldn't stop this time. And then I see the little screech owls. And obviously there was some just innate yeah. fear of this predator type bird, even though the screech owl was probably smaller than he was. But it's this predator shape, it's this predator bird. And I pull down the curtain, I'm going, see, they're on this side, you're on this side. But Alex had what was called object permanence. So he knew that they were you know, still on the other side of that curtain. And I just had to pack them up and take them back to the lab that night. And I just didn't dare take him home again because I knew he would still believe that they were there. Wow. My favorite of all the stories in the book is at times when you would be exasperated or angry or whatever the story would be and you'd come in maybe just louder than life. Alex would tell you, Irene, to calm down. Yes. yes. What was going on there? Well, sometimes, you know, he would get obstreperous and we would say, Alex, calm down. And so he learned the appropriate context in which to use that phrase. Wow. Discuss Alex's attachment to individuals like Spencer. Yes, Spencer was actually probably his favorite you know, human after me. And Spencer went to Africa to do some studies at one point. And Alex would sit there going, Sir, sir, come here, sir. He couldn't say Spencer, so he said, because oh. the S's are hard. SP is really hard. Yeah. Um, we found out later how hard SP was. So he would, you know, jump off the perch that he was on and, and clickety click and walk into the room, you know, Spencer's office, and you know, sir, sir. <laughs> oh, wow. It continues to be a struggle to support yourself. Oh yes, oh yes. Right now we have a small National Science Foundation grant, but it only pays part of the, the fees. And so I spend an awful lot of time going to bird clubs, going to fundraisers, sure. um, trying to, we have to raise $100,000 a year to keep the lab going. And uh, that's a significant amount of, of money. So we have an online store in the alexfoundation.org where we sell Alex Foundation things, uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, mouse pads, you know, you name it. Um, to try to make, raise money for the lab. Well, I hope our audience will do some shopping well, thank on you. that website. Thank you. I, I, another plug is that there are buttons so you can join something called I Give, which is an online um, system where when you join, we get $5, and then you go there first, and almost anything else you buy online, we get a few cents on that purchase. And it doesn't cost you anything. The merchants who are part of this donate a few cents of every purchase. Oh, so wonderful way to help. That's right. doesn't cost you a cent. Tell us about Alex's transference of none from same and different. That was a very exciting story. We are at the point doing number comprehension. We had already done number production. So you could give them a big tray of objects, red and blue balls and blocks scattered around, and you'd say, how many blue blocks? And he could look at this big mess of stuff. And, and count out the number of blocks. We had other data that shows he really was counting. That's right, say better. You're right, say better. That's right, key, how many? How many? How many key? Two. You're right. But production isn't the same as comprehension because you can have small children who you give them four marbles and they go one, two, three, four. There are four marbles and you think they know four. But if you give them a big bowl of stuff, they'll just, and you say, give me four, they go like this, because they don't really comprehend fourness. So we're doing a study on comprehension. So it was a very similar type of tray to the other study. This had been, he had been working on numbers for 10 years, so these trays were getting pretty boring. But now the task was, okay, what color six, or what color three, or something like that. And you'd have to find the set of objects. So again, they were like, you know, several different keys. So there would be blue keys and green keys and purple keys all mixed in. And it was, you know, how many, what color six. So I'd have to find the six of them and tell me the color. So the first dozen trials or so, as I mentioned before, first dozen trials or so, he rips through it. It's, it's somewhat fun because it's a different type of question. But then after the first dozen or so, it's the same stupid tray, the same stupid objects, and he starts acting up. So what he does is he you know, will turn his back when I show him the tray and start preening. 
or I'll take his beak and he knocks everything off the floor. <laughs> or he looks at it and, you know, let's say the color is, you know, they're blue, purple, and green things on the tray, and I say, what color? You know, six. And he gives me all the colors that are not on the tray to make it clear that it's not that he's making a mistake. He's just not playing. Not playing the game. <laughs> So, you know, we switched to giving, doing, using jelly bellies to see if he'll, you know, work for a jelly bean, which isn't a great thing for a parrot, but, you know, one a day, not so bad. We're doing one trial of this a day to keep his interest. And I walk in one time, and I've got the objects on the tray, and there are three, four, and six things on the tray, and the question of that day is, what color three? And this time he looks at me and he says, five. And I go, no, Alex, what color three? Five. And we go back and forth several times. And part of me is thinking, there's not five things on the tray. What's going on here, you know? The other part of me is going, he's not turning his back on me. He's not throwing things on the floor. He's not giving me random colors. What's with this five? So I finally look at him and say, okay, Smarty, what color five? And he looks at me and he goes, none. <laughs> there were no five things on the tray. He transferred absence of an attribute from same and different to absence of stuff. It was a zero-like concept. In Western civilization, we didn't get zero to the 1600s. Um, years ago, Dan Dennett had suggested I do something like this, and I thought, oh, this is really too hard. Yeah. You know, he couldn't possibly do it. Wow. But not only had he done it, but he had manipulated me into asking him the question that he wanted to answer, which was a whole nother level of complexity on this behavior. Wow, Irene. That was probably the most exciting thing he'd ever done. Wow. How about discuss purple and want grapes? Okay, that was the, the preliminary thing we had tried with this. Um, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, we had, we had done one trial, so I put a bunch of things on the tray without a purple object. Right. And the task at this point was, you know, what object is green? And if there were, you know, a green key, he would say key. And he did that quite, quite well. So here I put all these things on the tray and I say, okay, what's purple? Hoping he would say, none. none. And he looks at me and he goes, want grape. Wow. So, I mean, he had sort of, you know, gotten a backwards thing and it, it wasn't a bad thing to say, but it wasn't what I wanted. And that's when I decided, nope, you know, we can't, we can't do this none thing. But then years later he wow. pulls it on me. At this time in your life, you're at Radcliffe, your fellowship ends, you have your thermostat at 57, you're eating tofu, which as a vegetarian, I say that's a great thing. But, but a lot of people- 14 meals a week, you know. <laughs> but a lot of people wouldn't agree. So tell us what's going on financially yeah, in your it's, world. It's, it's really tough. I mean, I'm on unemployment. Um, my colleagues at, at Harvard and Radcliffe are trying to figure out, you know, how to help me. And we come up with the idea of putting in a grant proposal on optical illusions. How do these birds literally see the world? Yeah. Which was very exciting because, I mean, parrot vision is different from human vision. The eyes are on the opposite sides of the head. They see in the ultraviolet, which we don't, so they have better color vision than we do. But the question is, you know, in terms of perception, their, this visual system of theirs is, is wired somewhat differently than ours. Do they perceive the world in the same way? So we set up a series of optical illusions that we were going to present to Alex. And the first one, which was very simple, it's called the Mueller Liar. It's a very fancy term, but you all know what it is. It's two lines. One has arrows going this way. One has arrows going that way. The ones with the arrows going this way always looks longer. So we made the two sh lines different colors. And we'd show it to Alex and say, what color bigger, what color smaller? And he could tell us the color, or if he didn't see the illusion, he would say none. So we put in the grant proposal, of course it's rejected the first time, um, but we tweaked it to fix it up the way they wanted, and finally it is accepted, and we're pretty excited about this. Hallelujah. Is a bird's brain the same as ours? Well, yes and no. Okay, this, okay. Is, this is an interesting... You sound like a lawyer now. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you look at a bird brain, it looks nothing like our brain. Mm -hmm. Our brain has all these, they're called gyri and sulci. It's all these, you know, it, it, it's all these hills and valleys and it's very complicated looking. You look at a bird's brain, it just looks like a blob of stuff. Okay, very smooth. 
It turns out that even in the you know, 1900s, Kalischer was doing work showing that there were bird brain areas that seemed to be responsible for intelligent behavior. At the time, they called it a striatal area. It seemed that birds with the larger striatal areas, the parrots, the crows, the jays, would, would do better on intelligence tests than those birds with the smaller striatal areas relative to the size of the brain. And fast forward to the 1970s and people started looking at the song learning centers and started realizing that they were centers of song learning that were similar to our language learning centers. Mm -hmm. But I'd still go out and give talks and people would say, well, there's no cerebral cortex in the avian brain, the part of the brain that's in mammals and primates that's responsible for intelligence. And I'd say, look, I don't know, you go find it, because the bird is doing this stuff and he's using something to do it. <laughs> well, Nature Reviews Neuroscience 2005, Jarvis et al., where et al. is 20 other neuroscientists, they published showing all this work they've been doing for a decade, showing that the avian brain has a cortical-like area it's developed, it's derived from the same pallial area as the mammalian brain going back, you know, 280 million years ago to the dinosaurs. And that those birds, like as we knew before, the parrots, the crows, the jays, with the relatively larger area of, in this brain, again, is responsible for this relatively more intelligent behavior. So it doesn't look like our brain, but it functions like our brain. Wow. What are some of Alex's favorite activities? He really, really loved chewing up boxes. Um, he liked to practice his vocalizations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes he would get inside the box, which was a little bit of a resonating chamber, and he'd sit there playing with the sounds that we were working on. So this, when I say work, I mean, it, people think that I'm, you know, driving this bird like a little, little slave driver and things, but he would have fun playing with the sounds. He'd sit there going, Nail, chail, banal, gale, and he would play with these sounds, trying to get what we were doing. One time we had a film crew in, for example, and um, he was, we had not decided to do this, but he had gotten into whatever it was that he wanted to learn the color brown. So he would look at this cube or something and say, what color? And I'd go, brown, it's a brown cube, a brown block, and I'd put a piece of wool there, it's a brown wool. And he'd go, what color? And so the film crew thought this was cute, and they mm -hmm. filmed it for a few, you know, and then he kept doing it, and they said, well, this is stupid. You know, he's just, <laughs> you know, babbling. I said, no, no, no. He has to hear me say this many, many times, because he has to shape his entire vocal tract to come up with this new label, and brr. I mean, imagine going brr without lips. This is difficult. So he keeps asking me, so he keeps hearing it. He's driving this. I'm not training this. He was driving this, because for whatever, reason he found this of interest. Wow. It's just amazing. Tell us about your final exchange with Alex. Ah, yes. Sorry. Um, yes. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't know, let me f first say, it, we didn't know it was our final exchange with Alex. He was 31 years old. Uh, he just had his vet check and everything was fine. So we had no reason to think that that night was any different from any other night. We had a good night routine. For every night we had this good night routine and we set it up initially because we wanted to separate leaving at the end of the day, which was a normal experience, from a time out when he was being difficult and we wanted to, you know, break the session and I would, you know, leave him as a sort of a punishment for, you know, a minute or two. But, you know, putting him in the cage at night, that shouldn't be a punishment, that's just part of the day. So we set up a good night routine. I'm going to go eat dinner. I'll see you tomorrow. You know, you be good. And he started picking up parts of this. So we then had this little duet every night. And it changed every night. So people said, well, what were his exact last words? Well, you know, every night it was a little bit different. But the basic thing was, you know, one or both of us would say, you know, you be good. Yes, I'll try. I love you. I love you too. I'll see you tomorrow. Or you be in tomorrow. Yes, I'll be in tomorrow. So we would, would have this little routine. And it was a variation on that. And we walked out the door thinking, well, we'll just, we will be in tomorrow and we'll see each other tomorrow just like every other tomorrow. But this time it was not to be. It was not meant to be. What impact did Alex have on the world? It completely took me by surprise. Um, I mean, Alex had been popular. We had done lots of television things. Every time he did something exciting, like the, the nun, you know, we actually 
did that scientifically. We did a whole paper on it showing that it was repeatable. It wasn't just this, this one anecdotal thing. So yeah, the newspapers got onto it and there were you know, interviews all over. But you know, it would last a day or two and then it would fall apart. And so after he died, I was in complete shock. Um, it was on a, we found out about it on a Friday morning. It was just, it was a nightmare. Over the weekend, friends came from Washington. They drove up to be with me to help me. Um, local friends were making sure I, people were bringing food to make sure I would eat. They, you know, my friends, you know, would trundle me off to bed, not that I could sleep, but they would, you know, make sure I would get some rest. And over the weekend, the board, my board of directors from the Alex Foundation put together this obituary. And again, I, I was totally comatose, I mean, not functioning. But Monday morning, I call up the folks at, at, at Brandeis, who had been working with me on PR for years, and I say, well, you know, Alex died, and, and we have an obituary. And they say, well, you know, this is a bird. It's, it's not going to get a whole lot of traction. I said, just release it, you know, whatever. Um, we're getting phone calls. Rumors are coming through. You know, we need to make an official statement. So this is 9 a.m. It takes 40 minutes to drive from my house to Brandeis. And by that time I get to the lab, my phone, is, my cell phone's ringing off the hook, the lab phone's ringing off the hook, my lab manager's cell phone is ringing off the hook. I, people are calling from all over the world for interviews about this. And I'm, again, you go into interview mode, you hold the phone up, you, you know, close your eyes, focus on the question, answer it as best you can. I mean, I'm used to doing that, so I could snap into this interview mode. It was something I could hold on to, but I didn't think about the ramifications, I just, coped. And the emails were pouring in, 3,000 to my private account, boxes and boxes of mail coming, people telling me Alex's impact on their lives. There were three articles in the New York Times, I mean New York Times, his obituary was in The Economist. I mean that's, that's you know, that back page, it's reserved for world leaders, maybe Pavarotti, you know, folks like that, a parrot. Um, it was just, you know, Manchester Guardian, I, you know, all these, ugh, it, it was just overwhelming. And the letters from people were completely overwhelming. People telling me, I mean, there was one woman, she had been contributing $10 a month for quite a while, and I'd write her little thank you notes. Her nickname was Wren, which I thought was cute, and, you know, I'd write her little notes, thank you so much for assisting. And I do that. When people contribute, I mean, I, I have to say, maybe once in a while it falls through the cracks, but I really try religiously, whether it's $10 or 10000 I mean, for the person who's giving me $10, this could be more percentage of their, right. uh, their income. You never know. So I write little thank you notes. And so, but I'd never known backstory, and now she sends me a letter about her backstory. Uh, a number of years ago, she'd been diagnosed with one of these really nasty diseases that don't take you out, but make your life really miserable and she was suicidal. She just didn't want to cope with this and she's sitting there thinking about how she's going to end it all and the television's on and, and it turns out a little story about Alex and she looks at this little bird doing all this interesting stuff and, and somehow that gave her a new lease on life and she actually started thinking about this and got a bird and, and connected to this. Um, you know, amazing that, that you think that Alex somehow prevented somebody from... Pretty remarkable, yeah. isn't it? Um, we got letters from, from a grade school. Okay, the week before, the teacher had done a, a little project on animal intelligence. So she brought her gray into the classroom and talked about intelligence and conservation and stuff. When the children heard that Alex had died, they all wrote me notes, sympathy notes. So this is a, a grade school children drawing little pictures of Alex and then opening it up and, and writing these lovely little notes. It was just overwhelming. And that's, um, and so that's why I ended up writing the book because I realized that people didn't know my backstory. No. They were all sharing theirs. When I, when I go give, with giving talks, it was always science. You know, I'd be invited to international congress, you give the science. You go to a colloquium, you give the science, even at bird clubs. I mean, I just gave the science, and then I would, at the end, I would often say, well, I, we need some funds to keep this going, and we literally pass the hat. But I never shared with people the struggles that we had gone through, and I realized that they were sharing their struggles. I needed to share mine.
so glad that you did. Mm -hmm. How are your other birds? They're doing okay. Arthur's not much of a talker. We got him when I was at the Media Lab to do basically mechanical type stuff, so Interpet Explorer a web browser for parrots, you know, computer-based or mechanical mm -hmm. stuff. So we're trying to develop some more mechanical things for him to do. Griffin is a talker. Um, he's only had about a quarter of the training Alex had at his age, because when we first got him, we wanted to test out our training technique to see if other training techniques mm -hmm. would be as useful. So those didn't work, so we only had a certain amount of quote, quote, good training. And then when we moved to Massachusetts, instead of his having his own little lab space where we could do the training, now all the birds are in one room, and Alex started interrupting all of his sessions. Mm -hmm. So we'd be sitting there going, Griffin, what color? And Alex would say, no, you tell me what shape. <laughs> and so Griffin would shrug his little birdie shoulders, looking like, hmm. So, it was, def it was definitely hard. So, and now he still sometimes looks towards Alex's cage as if to say, um, you know, where are the answers? You used to tell me all the answers. So it, it's been an interesting, interesting journey. Did Alex mimic or did Alex think? Oh, he definitely thought. And, and everything that we did was to, to prove that. In closing, in your book, you quote Gandhi. And you say, in essence, be the change that you wish to see in the world, which is what Gandhi, one of his many uh, brilliant statements are that people reflect upon. So what I want to say is you've done that. You were a leader, and we appreciate and applaud all of your efforts, Irene, and we wish you the very best of things. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for coming you. today. Banana. Right. Good boy. You're right. What's it called? Shower. Right. Walk on chin. Can you go chin? In her book, Irene writes, parrots and other pets are not little humans. They are their own beings. Do they deserve to be treated with care and kindness? Of course. So let's listen to Karen Windsor from Foster Parrots, who at Animal Rights Day discusses some of the laws designed to protect these beautiful creatures. One of the very few pieces of legislation was the Wild Bird Conservation Act of 1992, and it impacted the, um, the trade in parrots by prohibiting the importation of the vast majority of wild-caught parrots into this country. Um, the intended benefit, one of the intended benefits of uh, that legislation was to preserve birds in the wild. Now here, we have some beautiful birds living in the wild the way they were meant to live. These first two photos that you've seen um, are photographs we took in Guyana. We operate a wild parrot conservation project in the South American country of Guyana. It's the um, wild scarlet macaw. Also, uh, Amazon parrots in Guyana. It's a hyacinth macaw uh, located in Brazil. This is the way we want to see parrots. Um, this is a photograph, actually, these are um, naturalized um, um, ring neck parrots in the Netherlands. They're considered an invasive species. This is one of the problems that the um, Wild Bird Conservation Act um, hoped to curtail. You know, this is um, exportation of parrots. These are dozens of macaws crammed into crates, and this is generally um, have, has been the fate of parrots in the wild. The um, Wild Bird Conservation Act um, took the United States off the market for parrots, but that still left all of Europe and Asia open to um, parrot importations, and it's, you know, it's been a lucrative business around the world. These are parrots in Guyana. Um, Guyana is one of two countries in South America that still legally exports its wildlife, which is why um, it, it is the place that we chose to work, because the trapping of parrots is still going on there. OK, one of the um, unintended consequences of the Wild Bird Conservation Act was that um, was the sudden acceleration of domestic breeding of so-called cage or companion birds in this country. And um, uh, much to the detriment of captive birds, um, there was no federal regulation in place to govern domestic breeding practices. And um, this, is, this industry remains largely unregulated on the federal and state level to this day. There are very few laws in place to protect parrots. And, um, 
the um, avian um, industry is really highly motivated to keep it that way. And they will fight um, tooth and nail to make sure that no legislation to protect parrots in the trade is ever passed. Um, this is a picture of um, a breeding facility. And I'm sure there are breeding facilities around the country. I don't want to make a blanket statement. They're not all horrible, but the vast majority of them look like this. Um, when you read ads for, um, from breeders, um, lots of times they're slinging, they're producing 20 or 30 different kinds of parrots. What do you think the conditions are like? Um, all these pictures that I'm showing you are from well-known breeding facilities that pump um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of parrots into the pet trade every year. Um, parrot, they're parrot mills, much on the same lines as puppy mills. And these are perfectly acceptable. This is a place, uh, it's beaches down in uh, North Carolina. And um, these are the conditions. These birds, you know, at least they get sunshine, but they have very little else. They don't have very much room to spread their wings. They certainly don't have any enrichments. These are dirty balls. Once again, really hard to see, but um, it's mud, water. The conditions are horrible. They're bare bones. And this is uh, prevalent all over the United States because there are no laws to govern this. As a matter of fact, as long, most places, if you can show that there's some kind of shelter, some kind of evidence of a bird having had food and water in, in, in the last state, that's about all they need. And um, there's nothing that the law can do to come into a place like this. I mean, look at this poor guy. He's only got one eye. I had to throw a few in because this is a pretty pathetic situation. But this is what's happening to birds all over the country. And um, this is what we're motivated to deal with. But it's hard because once, once again, there are no laws. There's nothing that any agency can come in to do to, to, to help this bird. These are birds that were put up for public auction recently. And these are the birds that are um, producing the babies that you see in the pet stores. So it looks like a happy situation in the pet stores, but um, it's hell behind the scenes. And I think that one of our biggest frustrations as a parrot rescue organization is the fact that when babies are um, bred under these kinds of conditions and um, then are removed from their parents, you've got parental deprivation, you've got um, another species raising a species, you have um, gavage feeding where there's no nurturing, um, no care, um, forced weaning, um, all of these things impact uh, the psychology of a parrot. So what you end up with is a product, um, you know, that's basically a psychologically damaged animal that doesn't even stand a chance of being a good pet. Parrots are highly intelligent, um, just like dolphins or primates or humans. Um, intelligent species do require a prolonged nurturing period in order to be well-adjusted adults. The one piece of legislation um, on the federal level um, that should be in place to protect parrots would be the Animal Welfare Act. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, this is, th this is legislation that was enacted to govern the treatment of animals used in um, experiments, in, exp in um, exhibition, and as pets. Um, it mandates standards of humane care in regards to environmental conditions, light, food, water, exercise. Um, parrots apparently are exempt from protection under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and so are many other kinds of animals. Cold-blooded reptiles, amphibians are excluded. In her book, Dr. Pepper Bird writes, Alex taught us that we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. The separateness notion was a dangerous illusion that gave us permission to exploit every aspect of the nature world. Animals, plants, minerals, all without consequences. We are now facing those consequences.